when I did my language prelim, Richard Robinson reached over like that to his shelf of Sanskrit books, and his, you know, his hand came on this such and such book. He didn't know. And, and then he opened it up, and he said, oh, do this. <laughs> well, this Haribhadra's commentary on, I think, the 8,000 Stains of Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. And when I had done it, gave it to him the next day, he said, oh, you did much better than I thought you would. <laughs> So, um, oh, you should know about uh, Jose Cabazon's article, which must be his review of Huntington's book. Is that in the list? And there may be a response from Huntington and a further response. Is there a further response? It's a change of three articles between Cabazon and Huntington. All so of it, which um, I have, I can definitely mm. and So we. So mm. There's also three other reviews of Huntington's book, mm. which I can also think So Cabazon's is particularly helpful. Yeah, so Cabazon's review, it should be Huntington's response, and then uh, Cabazon's response to the response. And it probably ended there. That's where it stops. I ended one thing there, where the person made a response to my response. And, you know, there was a review of a book. He responded, I responded, he responded. I thought, this is getting silly. Plus, I thought his response was beneath contempt. <laughs> but I still think I did the wrong thing. It's like you've got to respond. Otherwise, people think you're lying down. To me, it was like, this is garbage. This is, you know, it's, it's gone far enough. And I couldn't see the title of it, response to the response to the response <laughs> to the review. So um, I'd like to go on uh, speaking about the analyses of the four types of production. All right? Last time we began talking about that. In order to bring it to life, if we can, I think we brought to life, certainly, the analysis of motion at the beginning of the course. Um, has, was this one as lively for you? <coughs> Did this one mean as much to you as the analysis of motion? It's perhaps the most popular reason throughout all of Madhyamaka literature. Even if Chandrakirti says the analysis, the sevenfold analysis of the person is the one yogis are to begin with, if you looked at the whole scope of Madhyamaka literature, the analysis of production from self, other, both, and neither is, uh, wow, it's like, uh, that's so vital. You know, sometimes these analyses strike you as, eh, who cares? Uh, and this one, obviously, for so many Indians, they care. Uh, talking about the possibilities of production, caused and uncaused, and within cause, self, other, both, uh, just really hit them. And well, I've sort of thought that Chandrakirti's sort of thought. I've thought that Ch Chandrakirti's emphasis on sevenfold reasoning, you see, which has to do with the entity, with what's right in front of you. You get at the entity by way of analyzing its relationship with its basis of designation. Same, different, right? And then all the permutations. With regard to you no, know, I'm like probably in the issue of why did he shift to something else? He himself deals with the production of himself out of both and neither. Does he? Yes, we're, we're reading. Um, 
See, Ed has to tell me. Yeah, yeah. That's right, Johnny. <laughs> gives me a certain wink or something that, that gets me back on the track. <laughs> but he has other analyses of production, too. Um, anyway, why he put so, emphasis, so much emphasis on this is that it may have a big appeal to some people because you're not analyzing this, you know, marvelous coat by way of its causes, its production, you know, referring to something else that you don't see. But with a simple analysis, you're looking at the very thing itself. You can analyze effects, too. This, this won't exist if it doesn't have any effects. But again, the effects we're not seeing right in front of us. So it's interesting to speculate on why some people are so turned on by one or another of these, of these analyses. Right? Maybe Buddhists, for Buddhism, production of things by causes is so important. And thus the analysis of uh, production. That, that, that in other words, the causes of things were not vaguely connected to the thing, but are vital to it. And if you can't figure out the causes, it's just like you can't figure out where motion takes place. So it has to come to life. So inherent existence has to be something that is so vital, use the word vital again, doing it differently, but it's something with, you know, that is just so overwhelming that we're totally addicted to it, right? There has to be. Otherwise, how could belief in it be the very source of cyclic existence? So when you read the various scholars and how they talk about what is being refuted by these reasonings, is it something that is so much a part of the fabric of our lives that we couldn't do without it. We feel it. And if it's going to have a, if understanding of emptiness is going to have a soteriological import, then it's got to be that basic. So to some people, it may seem that consideration of the causes of things is like, well, I'm not particularly interested in that anyway, so it's a superimposition to add that on to what I'm presently doing, even if we're engaged in all sorts of causes, like going to the grocery store and buying food, as I hope to on my way home today, so that I'll have food in the refrigerator. <laughs> Those are causes. Even if we're constantly engaged in causes, may the vocabulary of it and so forth may just not be something that impinges on our way of life, I guess. So in here in existence, there must be something that you would die for. And it's, that's what in here in existence is like. Isn't it? It's got to be. It's got to be to die for. And one way to die, to risk your life, is just about the ultimate sacrifice. It's one of those <laughs> more, one's own life is one of the more highly prized. Uh, things of love. I mean, uh, 
your love for somebody else may be higher, somebody else's life may be higher, your child's life may be higher, right? But this is one of the high. At least we say it is. And we behave much of the time that way. Like passing somebody in a place where you shouldn't pass in the car. <laughs> you know, where for some tiny little effect we will disregard this thing that we're supposed to prize, so we pretend we're prizing so highly. I think that's a great study. What a fantastic study. And then, you know, to get a list of the things that people will just give it up for, the tiny things. And you could, you know, sort of rank them. <laughs> two more minutes, you know? You'll get there two minutes early. <laughs> That's great. And there's a place where I pass people on my road where you're not supposed to pass. <laughs> So in the context of to die for, where desire is so strong that uh, one will use words, I'm dying to go to bed with someone. So where which it is such that context is lost, right? When you pull out to pass somebody in a particularly dangerous place so that you can get to Charlottesville. Hey, it might even be five minutes earlier. <laughs> Never mind two minutes, it might be five. Where context is destroyed. I suppose in those instances, it's not so much desire as it is confusion, bewilderment. Right? That's just bewilderment, confusion. You just, you know, says, oh, I need some time, or oh, I gotta get by this guy. Uh, whereas uh, to die for was, you know, a case of tremendous desire, right? Hatred, same where context is lost, where one's own values are, you can't even say superseded, they just, they just uh, drop out. So to oppose inherent existence, to oppose belief in inherent existence, um, requires and this force of mind. You know, you're opposing something that is extremely ingrained. Extremely ingrained. And one of the purposes, the purpose of these reasonings is to overcome that ingrained belief, right? And so the reasonings are not for the sake of, you know, some sort of public display. Oh, now we're taking care of this or that, you know, system. But of getting at ingrained, extremely habituated beliefs. And as you're finding with the self other both neither reasoning, it's not it's not appealing. It is appealing. It is reasoning. Based on based on whatever. And one thing I've thought is You know, it's sort of a, when you get angry at somebody or desirous or, you know, there are certain qualities of that person across the room and the mind is taking, you know, your mind is taking the mind 
the, these qualities that are then to die for. You know, it's a very sort of busybody type mind. You get angry at somebody, you know, oh, they did this, and they have this quality and that quality. If you take that very busybody mind, very same busybody mind, and use it to look into the nature of phenomena, that I think is one of the great values of using these reasonings. That it's involving that very same type of mind. Because otherwise, you know, when you take a religious holiday, which is really great, and stare at the sky or whatever it is one does, uh, then, you know, immediately thereafter on the way home, you're shouting or screaming or you see somebody, you know. Uh, you know, the two don't come together, and that's why I call it a religious holiday. Everybody needs a holiday. We all do. Uh, to actually, for that practice to get to the point where it actually isn't just something else that you're doing, like going to this restaurant instead of that restaurant, and this restaurant's a hell of a lot better, and you get a much better time, better service, and everything's copacetic, and, and it's nice and open and easy and so forth, right? And, but to get a practice to the point where it actually impacts on how you usually conceive of things, it's, uh, that's very difficult. Extremely difficult. It's in Los Angeles, and uh, a fellow wanted a professor wanted to take me to his religious organization, which took about an hour trip. You know, of course, it's Los Angeles, and of course, it goes. You go by car, and uh, he called his friend at the establishment. They wanted me to join. I didn't realize this when he <laughs> said, "Would you like to go visit it?" I said, yeah, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, <laughs> so he called his friend, his friend drove up to pick us up, and I uh, got in the car, and his friend who's driving is just mouthing off and saying the most terrible things about the people on the highway, and he's just rattling off from beginning to end of that track. I couldn't believe it, you know? Member of some religious organization, great. So we get to the place and, you know, the house is set up, it's sort of, there's not too much light, this and that. And I immediately fell asleep because I'd been at a conference. And I went to sleep. When I woke up, they said, oh yeah, that happens to a lot of people who come here. <laughs> but he was sweet as anything, sweet as sugar, once he opened that door and got inside that house. Just sweet. And then they began working on me. They brought out a book about the sect. And they put their feet under my, under my chair, sat on both sides, you know, their feet on chair, <laughs> occasionally touching me, you know. <laughs> when they thought I was thinking something good, they, you know. <laughs> so I was coming through this book and I said, oh shit, they think I'm gonna convert. <laughs> uh, then, you know, we had lunch, they could see they weren't gonna convert. <laughs> <laughs> We had lunch, and we get back in the car, and here it is, I thought, now this guy must be cooled out by now. He's had all this time in the house, you know, please, pleasing atmosphere, everything was so sweet. And ah, just as soon as he gets in the car, I see. just from beginning to end, the whole hour, just carrying on. So if you take that very same mind, you see, it's quite like it. It's just so pissed off and it's saying this and saying that and there's this quality and there's that quality and this and that. And you use that very same mind, you see the very same type of mind that is not finding things or, you know, that is analyzing the nature of phenomena. I, I think there's a, a special power because it's that kind of mind. And uh, there are many other practices don't get me wrong, okay? Many other practices that 
and even more profound and so forth. But I think this is particular power to this type of analysis. You get really, it's not like this, it's like that. And that, that type of mind is getting used to, you know, I, you can't get any farther, you know? It's not, what? You, it's getting used to, like the, like the guy when he opened his door. <laughs> he was used to it. <laughs> not like that. So it's a particular feature of it. Of course, if you then turned it into a matter on which you just rattled on and so forth to other people, or, then you've just reduced what could be a way of attacking, in a sense, conceptuality as a way of increasing more and more and more conceptuality. Now, there are different styles, and I, styles within text that talk about emptiness, I don't know if we've talked about this in this class. You haven't done it here. She does only been a bit so long. Tony Dino Bezzo was the same. Ring on down. Ring on down, Tony Dino Bezzo. She down. Tony, you know, is emptiness. Dino Bezzo means, uh, I don't know, <laughs> settling the mode of Dino Bezzo, settling, delineating, modes of delineating emptiness. Dino Bezzo. Literal translation, settle. It's, uh, you would expect something like she da war, but I'm quite sure it's she da. But I think it means something like looking at bases. Something like a chair. You see it's she, and you're investigating and analyzing is it this way, is it that way, and so forth. Ringo da, which maybe it's something like looking, which is how it looks to realization, to the face in the face of knowledge, realization. This isn't the rigba of nyingma, but it still is the rigba of a very profound consciousness. <coughs> Settling emptiness sort of as it looks in meditative equipoise. And settling emptiness in terms of bases. This base, that base, this, you know, <laughs> substrat. So you're involving the objects. Whereas you see, in the face of meditative equipoise, you can just say, no form, no feeling, no, 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 no. And it's a more of a psychological description. And I think the appeal is to draw a person into that state by describing the state. And I was thinking this morning of Edie Hirsch, who uh, uh, was uh, one of the readers of John. He was the outside reader of John Power's dissertation. And he was reading the Sunday Demotion Sutra. And of course, he read it as literature. And of course, as you read, Literature, you are drawn into states, right? That's like that. And this is more, I don't know, philosophical, ontological. You know, if we say this is psychological, and we split psychological and philosophical for our purposes here. This is more psychological, this is more philosophical or 
uh, or epistemological and ontological. When do these come up in the Well, John Gap, for instance, makes some reference to she does only the Nobel I forget where, in section on Prasangika, I believe, uh, that that's the perspective from which he's speaking. And I think what often happens in Gelupa literature or Gelupa presentations, well, I, I shouldn't say literature, but anyway, it's all literature, uh, is that they take something that is of the second variety, like one of Buddha's sutras, and they're imposing the first mode on it. And then that gets so uncomfortable because you're always adding in you know, inherently, you know, it doesn't just say form doesn't exist or something. Form doesn't exist in the face of Mate Vakapos, you see? There's no need to qualify. It does not inherently exist in face. No, there's no need to qualify. Form does not exist in face of Mate Vakapos. Does that mean form doesn't exist? No. Yeah. So you see, uh, they're opting for the first one over the second one. And Quite often, other traditions are opting for the second one. Uh, and I think what is often missed in Gelupa readings of literature is that they aren't superimposing the first one on, on uh, texts that are the second, and not uh, appreciating as much as, say, one could the use of literature to just draw you into that state. And of course, they get other advantages for what they do. What's the base? The base is like the, the substrate of the table, its emptiness going, and its emptiness. Whereas when you talk about meditative equipoise, that's a state beyond. You, you know, these bases are no longer appearing. The substrata are no longer apparent. And I think much of the controversy between the sects in Tibet is because uh, one of them at some point opts to go with the, with the psychological or epistemological mode uh, before the other one does. Before in the um, in terms of prioritizing, or before in terms of in terms of we'll do this before you guys do it. I mean. No, uh, in the sense of in talking about the process of meditation. Uh, for instance, in Gelu, the meditative equipoise, you have uh, the wisdom consciousness, the Yeshe, that is uh, realizing. Emptiness. Now, I think a more psychological take on it would be to just fuse the wisdom consciousness and emptiness and take them as just one thing. There's a whole lot of Chinese Buddhism like this, there's a lot of Tibetan Buddhism like this. Because in the state of meditative background for this, there is no distinction between the wisdom, even Galen would say, right? There's no distinction between the wisdom consciousness and the emptiness that it realizes. There's no distinction. And as one of my teach, Gelug teachers said, it's more one than one. It's more one than, you know, it's, uh, in technical terminology, it's Dokpa Chik. It's one you know, only this talk. Dogma, dogma, there's nothing more one than, than things that are dogma <laughs> chi. So you can't say roa chi either. Well, it, it's beyond even roa chi. Once you say dogma What does dogma mean? Dogma means. What does dogma mean? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you feel a bit uh, Sorry, <laughs> the uselessness of your uh, summer like teaching? <laughs> <laughs> Make a new uh, Somebody tell her what dogma means. I see. 
conceptual, conceptually isolatable factor or whatever. All these yeah, lousy yeah. translations. Yeah, yeah, I said it, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you see they will relegate to a metaphor of water poured in water this period where you pour two sources of water together in one bowl. You can't say, this is the water from this source, this is the water from that source, right? So they convey that through the metaphor. But then when they set up the discussion about the system, they set up a system of wisdom and emptiness. Not as one. This one's impermanent, that's permanent, right? You separate them out. And another system will begin its, you know, won't take that. They'll say that these are not even fused, you know? It's not even two things poured together. They always were together. Do tell them that. There's no coming together of them and separating of them. This is the way it is. So this is the mind vajra that is the basis of all phenomena, or whatever. This has often helped me. Uh, and Ginnan Lotre, uh, who was a Goman Geshe, uh, was fond of using this distinction. Because he, he knew its import. Hmm. The metaphor, I think, certainly for the state of meditative equipoise, they are, uh, you know, the, the, the metaphor that applies is not the pouring together, but the being. But prior to meditative exercise, when one thinks about emptiness, right? That's the consciousness in this emptiness. And thus, the is not yet. It's, it's not yet. But that's the value of the metaphor again. Sure. The pouring part is also that, and that those two are going to come together. Especially in Gil. But in the like, Nyingma presentation, these two have been and always will be together and they're right there. And they merely, merely need to be on public campus. So, you know, it's like the people who are organizing, I am not making fun of people now, right? Obviously, I make fun of myself. Who are organizing a retreat to meditate on the fundamental innate reality beyond all conceptuality, okay? They're organizing. They're all pissed off at each other. <laughs> it's just silly, isn't it? So what I'm suggesting is that there may be a powerful source in a source of help in using this mind, you know, that gets pissed off, attracted, and so forth, to uh, look into whether things are produced from self, other, both, neither, or or whatever the particular type of analysis is, to engage that type of mind in the process so that it isn't something that maintains its own thriving existence, even when you think you're in the most profound meditation, you know, and you come out of it and it's like right there, <laughs> and just takes back over. <laughs> hmm. As Jung said, most theory is subjective confession. <laughs> so. It's 
and take it as confession of my own self rather than as criticism of others. So, if something were produced from itself, if this watch were produced, is this, we sort of feel that in a way, don't we? I mean, it, it's the same as it was five minutes ago. So it's produced itself over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah, it changes every moment. But you know, it just produces itself all over again. You know, until at some point it just sort of can't do that anymore. <laughs> But, you know, sometimes we think, well, I, I would never think that things are produced from themselves. But I think we already think that they're produced from themselves. And, and in, in its grossest sense, this is the grossest sense of produced from self, is that it reduplicates exactement, moment by moment. Exactement. Isn't it? Don't we have, I mean, that sense, that gross sense, I mean, no Sankhya ever asserted that. No, I mean, production of himself, self-production, Dakye, is the system of the Sankhyas. They never asserted anything that gross. But I think, you know, it just sort of reduplicates moment by moment. It's exact, exactly the same as you know, as it was, the same old watch, until at some point you notice, oh my God, it's all scarred up and it's, I can't see it anymore. <laughs> it couldn't, suddenly it couldn't reduplicate. <laughs> but now, you can see, really, if you think about it, that if this was produced, just literally, this is in a very gross sense, if it was produced, if it had any need to be produced from itself, if it already was there, and had to be there a second time somehow, if there was some need for that, then that would always be needed. If it had to be produced, if it was already there, if it already attained existence, and yet it needed to attain existence in exactly the same, you know? Boom. They wouldn't need to the next moment. It would be the same need forever. And it would go on forever. But what's so amusing is this extremely gross idea is pretty much, I don't know, it's sort of how we see things, isn't it? They sort of even though they're wearing out all the time, right, you say? But there's just sort of some point at which, oh, I guess I need a new car. You know? I don't, that's for somebody who has money. <laughs> have to do it on one's own level of, <laughs> of uh, economic strength. So, and if it did replicate itself once, exactement, it would replicate itself forever if it could do it once, then it could forever. It would have to forever. So the Sankhya is not this done. But to me, I think it's very important to recognize that we are this done. Okay. <laughs> oh, I've never asserted Dakya. Production for himself. Oh, 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 oh. You know, when it's no longer working, then it's, oh, what happened to it? You know, as if that's a big surprise. That in the process of changing moment by moment, it no longer was able to function as a watch. You know, wow, big surprise. What else is new? Yet the fact that we are so surprised by gross changes, by gross changes, suggests that we think it was replicating itself 
Exactement. Up until that point. And then somehow, mysteriously, you know, how could it means there's no process. I didn't think there was any process of causation that could have interfered with this. I mean, give me a break. It's wind, it's whatever, right? The nails get rusty. The center of the house, you know? What do you expect? The Sankhya is much more, you know, doesn't think that. They have that sort of junky idea. But thinks. There's a whole lot of things that came together to produce this watch. And this watch is one thing. So there must have been something that, you know, brought all these various things, you know, tied these things together. Maybe easier to think of something that's organic, I don't know. Do you get the idea? It, there has to be something cohesive between the, the whole set of causes, right, and the effect. So there's some nature that is shared between the cause and the effect. And that's what's called self-production. So, and they hold that the effect is non-manifest in the causes and becomes manifest. That's what, if you want to use the word production, that's what production means, it's manifestation of what was existent there and became manifest. You say, I always was a professor. <laughs> Don't we say things like that? Born to be president. Well, do we have this idea of sort of things that are already there in a non-manifest state? <laughs> do we? I don't know. How much? It's like the yeah. yogurt example, or the, the uh, butter in the middle. Carving away. Carving away. Still. Carving, definitely, right? Yeah. You see. It, it's hard to imagine Finding that. the form that is present. Well, if you're a diamond mine, you think, yeah. oh, this could be a wedding, a diamond engagement ring someday. That's like the carving. It's like carving. Right. There's a whole new um, school of psychology that's coming out, too, about um, if you go back to what you thought about when you were a child, what was important to you when you were a child, that you can find what you're supposed to be, something like self-help, find a career kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to go back to what you like to play with when you were a child. Mm -hmm. And it's there within you. You always knew it's one to be a little. What did you say? Horses. <laughs> Those things born to do this, right? I was born to cook. Sounds sensible, too. I mean, even in Buddhist terms, a certain amount of karma, right? That's going to shape how the person's going. How else do we? Do we? I don't you know. Sometimes you think we don't, but we do. Like you're saying, you have stimulated me. Born to be something, but we always say that we could be anything. Or at least in this country, we sort of think that we, we could be a person, or we could be whatever we want to be. Is that the same? Because then everything's there. Well, yeah. That every, everything, I see everything's there in the posing sense. Wow. Hmm? Those are the production from other than the sense that uh, you have all these influences, sort of the nature of uh, you are what you were born to be. Is this the nature nurture debate? Mm -hmm. 
Wow. So I'm curious about where the karmic predispositions come into that too. I mean, is it just that the karma is sort of shaping something, or do we and we have believe in that, or do we believe more that it's you know it's already there? Yes, that's the difference. Believe that you believe it's already there, it needs to be manifested, or do you just believe that there are predispositions? Educators talk about my son as having a lot of potential. And I think that they're thinking that it's already there in him. Mm. Uh, mm. Talk about potentials. Mm. Document. And then you see what you can do with that potential. Mm. You, I mean, you could be anything, but then you see what, what you can actually do with it. So then that's just like a predisposition. It's this material. You're something that has material that. Yes, you have to let it materialize. It's big. It That's can be a big thing. <laughs> it can be shaped in different ways, but it will be big. Yes, big. There's also a, like, a value to it. I mean, you say not yeah, living up to your potential. I mean, that's assuming that not only do you it's have potential, common. but it's a certain kind of potential. Yeah, you know, there's an expectation. I see a pre existent thing there that you are not measuring up to. Mm. But is that Danke? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you all know the assignment for next time. Newman, the first, Newland, 95 to 157. Napper, 123 to 150. Well, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs>